I'm Michaela, and I'm here to talk to you guys today if my shirt and the title, the PowerPoint, and what they just said didn't give it away. Feminism, which I promise, no matter what you've heard, is not a dirty word. So feminism is defined by the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes. For me, feminism has been a long, fruitful, and often exhausting journey. I didn't start out identifying as a feminist though I've probably been one since the day I was born. And many of you, whether you're part of the 30% of people who identify as feminists, probably are one too. Um, my grandmother was a second wave feminist and is now a fourth wave feminist and probably still a second wave feminist. She was part of the bra burning, draft card burning, anti-war generation who believed in radical change on a radical scale. Feminism has changed a lot over the last century and over history. Feminism has existed since the beginning of time. Since the moment the first Neanderthal man told the first Neanderthal woman what exactly she was supposed to do and she didn't listen. <laughs> but feminism, as historians and social scientists define it, has come in four waves. The first being uh, first wave feminism, obviously, which was the suffrage movement and began in the late 19th century and lasted into the 20th century, about 1920 when the women were granted the right to vote. So, uh, there's a slide. Here's some women of the first wave. Um, they were all really cool and did very different things, all within the idea of the suffrage movement. Um, Carrie Chapman Cat is the second picture. Um, Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, all very important and impactful women who had very different views on how suffrage should be accomplished. Carrie Chapman Cat believed that they should work on it, work for it on a state-by-state -state basis, a much slower and less radical process. Whereas Lucy Burns and Alice Paul both believed that they should campaign for a constitutional amendment, something that had been pressed for, for but never accomplished. They used a lot of different methods, some more radical than others, uh, including campaigning in front of the White House and picketing. Con consistently during World War I, which was extremely controversial because during the Civil War, women stopped campaigning pretty much altogether. After women were granted the right to vote in 1920, after Tennessee was the last state to ratify it, and it became the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, we sort of hit a lull in terms of feminism, as an organized movement, we'll say. In the 1930s, women's role was just as important as men's in keeping families and the country financially afloat. And during World War II, women's role was integral in the U.S. successes in the war abroad. But during the 1950s, when housewifedom became the token job description for women and the baby boom hit, many middle and upper class white women found themselves dissatisfied with the state of their lives. Betty Friedan, with her book The Feminine Mystique, gave a voice to the problem with no name. And in that sparked the second wave feminist movement. However, again, much like the first wave, there was a divide. Some more radical feminists thought that there should be more radical steps taken on different issues. Women like Billie Jean King and Gloria Steinem were members of the women's liberation movement, which, like I mentioned, were big on bra burning and other controversial and radical demonstrations to draw attention to issues that were not being affected by the women in uh, the other side of second wave feminism. They were focused primarily on wage inequality, racial issues, the women's right to choose, and women's health issues. They used a lot of different methods, like protesting here for the ERA, and participated in consciousness raising, which is where women of all creeds discussed the issues that were facing them. Through that, women were able to realize that the issues that they were dealing with were not singular. They were not their own. They were not theirs to be guilty for. They are issues facing society and the world as a whole. After second wave feminism, we again hit sort of a lull as the country moved socially away from progress and the more liberal views of the 1960s and 70s into a more conser socially conservative era of the 1980s. As women like Phyllis Schlafly campaigned against the ERA, it fails to get enough state support to become a constitutional amendment. Then we have third wave feminism, which is very much unlike the two before it, and that it focuses in sectionality, yourself, individualism. It is defined by the Anita Hill hearing, wherein she testified against Justice Clarence Thomas, accusing him of sexual assault, or harassment, for my mistake. Um, we have the appointment of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the second female Supreme Court justice. 
and you have journalists and women who shape this more individualized approach to feminism. You also have things like riot girl feminism, which was a punk view to feminism, wherein by being your most authentic self, you were inherently being a feminist. By defining social standards, you were being a feminist, which was an idea that had been around since the beginning, but they were just interpreting it differently. There's also this idea of reclaiming your femininity during third wave feminism, something that had sort of been moved away from during first and second wave. They used a lot of different methods, obviously picketing. There was also take backs and night walks, which focused primarily on sexual assault and violence that women faced on the street and in public spaces. And then finally, after third wave feminism, we get fourth wave feminism, which is where we are now, which is what I am, fourth wave feminist. And we are in a very unique position. Almost all feminism today happens online, which can be scary and very confusing. But our generation of feminism is going to be defined similarly to the ones before us in that there are very impactful and important women that are going to help shape it. Christine Blasey Ford, Michelle Obama, Little Miss Flint, the freshman 2018 uh, female Congress members, Alyssa Milano, who sort of helps the Me Too movement gain ground on Twitter. But our methodology is a little bit different. You have things like the Me Too movement, which occurred in primarily a social media space. But we also march. We rally, but differently. And people are concerned that it's going to be too different from previous feminist movements to accomplish anything. So how do we navigate this new, this new modern feminist era? When you're online, you, follow, you can follow thousands of feminist accounts run by thousands of young people across the world who can often offer insight, information, and opinions on topics that you might not know, not know that much about. But in navigating that, you have to be aware of something. We all have affirmation bias, which is where we seek out and believe information that reaffirms beliefs we already have. And that can be dangerous. If you're viewing content from an account you already follow, it's likely because you like the content that that account posts which means you agree with them, which means you're not seeing different sides and perspectives. So keep in mind that everything you see on the internet is true. Fact check your local feminist content creators. So yes, our methodology is different. And yes, the things we do and say are different, but the focuses are still the same. When navigating this new modern wave of feminism, we have to keep in mind that we can learn from previous waves. Talk to second and third wave feminists. Read their literature. Talk to them. You are young, but you are not naive. We just stepped into these shoes. They're still rubbing a little bit. Get up, stretch your legs. Go to a town hall, go to a rally, live tweet the event, and then go home and write an eloquent blog post about it. Welcome to the fourth wave. Thank you.